Hi folks, and welcome back to the Engadget stage here at CES 2019. I am Chris Schott, I'm a video producer and reporter with Engadget, and I'm a photography enthusiast, which is why I'm sitting here today with two guests to talk about photography. We have Steen Heiner, a senior technical manager at Nikon, and Drew McCallum, a senior technical specialist at Canon. The two cameras we have that we're looking at today are the first professional grade mirrorless offerings from your respective companies, or at least the first sort of targeting that, that high-end dedicated market. So I want to ask why 2018 was the right time for these to come out. Was there something that had changed in the available technologies that made these easier, or do you see it just as a shift in what the consumers were asking for, the feedback you were hearing? Well, this is our first full frame into the mirrorless realm. We've had the, the EOS M series for, for several years now, um, and when it comes to uh, the, the, the full frame side, we had to take a look and see what's going to carry us into the future for the next you know, 30, 40 years. Of course, it's not a, it's not a minor decision to, to make a, a change in amount. Uh, our, of course, one of the things that, that we wanted to maintain was the legacy to our F-mount lenses uh, through the generations. Uh, so as a result, you know, there's uh, the hundreds of lenses, different iterations of Nikkor lenses that can be adapted uh, to our uh, Z products. Customers tell us all the time what they want in a mirrorless camera. They, they were sort of anticipating it while at the same time we're thinking about developing it or in, in the process of developing it. So you brought up the mirrorless systems you've had before, the Nikon One and the EOS M. I wanted to ask, are there any lessons you took from the development of those systems? Anything in, in the production of kind of your, your first major mirrorless offerings that helped inform your decisions on these new products? We had the, the, the 70D in 2013 was our first real uh, live view focus type system mm -hmm. on sensor. So that was our dual pixel CMOS AF introduction. Um, and then that carried over into the M series and what you're seeing now into the, the EOS R. And moving forward with touch and drag AF. So we've taken that uh, just basically a simple autofocus system to now a full interface working with the R and not even having to direct AF points. You just move your thumb across the screen. So we've really taken those lessons and how to change focus. Where do you want to direct the focus? Um, we, we've been doing that with the DSLRs, and now we moved it into the mirrorless as well. So it, it's a merge of, of a lot of those technologies. Was it possible to adapt the systems you developed for your existing DSLRs to these, or did you kind of have to start from the ground up to rebuild for a system that doesn't use a mirror? It would have been very easy to just simply use the same mount, develop a new camera, but we wouldn't have been able to take advantage of our sort of key objectives, which was the best possible optical performance that we that we could. Uh, by removing the mirror, of course, we're able to move the uh, the flange back distance to a very close to the sensor. Uh, we widen the, the mount to a, a, a much larger mount, of course, which can collect more light. Uh, it allowed, really, for our lens designers to make lenses that weren't possible for an F mount before. We just introduced a 14 to 30 millimeter ultra wide angle. It's a very, very small lens, very compact, but gives the sort of edge-to-edge -edge sharpness that uh, uh, professionals and uh, enthusiasts have come to expect from us. So We had some design ideas in, in making the highest optical performance that we could. We had to have a high-performing camera system itself. We had to take into account size and weight and balance all of that together. I mean, we're looking at the lens there. That's a 28 to 70 f2. That type of lens could have been made for a DSLR. It could have, but that lens is three and a half pounds. If we made it for the EF mount, we could have done it, but it would have been probably twice as big. And you know, a six pound lens is not something that you're gonna hand, held, hand carry all day long. When we announced the cameras, of course, we made a big deal about the fact we have a 58 millimeter 0 0.95 uh, knocked Nikkor coming, which is a, a demonstration of what is what the system is capable of, of course. It's not a lens, an everyday lens for somebody, but of course, uh, we have a whole roadmap of very exciting lenses coming. The whole system is sort of designed to evolve, uh, and we're looking forward to the opportunity to be able to build uh, uh, very specific and very exciting lenses for that mount. The so mount that, changes everything, really. Right. Both of your companies did end up designing new mounts. Was there ever a conversation about keeping the classic mounts from your full frame pro systems? We did make uh, the camera fully compatible with every EF lens that, that you have out there, so we have to take into account 
the legacy user base, you know, 100 million lenses that are out there already, <laughs> we have to take into account that. So with the, the R system, we introduced uh, the amount adapters to allow for that. But 30 years ago, when we introduced the EF system, I'm not sure we then saw 50 megapixel cameras and full HD video and uh, 4K video and 8K video in the future. We want to build this system so 30 years from now, someone who's sitting on the stage can say, yeah, we had this and this is what's going forward. The future compatibility, we wanted to strike a perfect balance between size and weight. Uh, we've heard a lot from our customers that uh, uh, as good as our DSLRs are, sometimes you know they can be a little, a little heavy to carry. Not only will this adapt to our current line of 90 plus existing Nikkor lenses, but there are over 360 uh, legacy uh, variety, uh, different uh, uh, legacy lenses that will be adaptable uh, uh, to this camera too. So that was very important to us. We didn't want to throw all of that away. Can you give a, a brief breakdown of how a shorter distance from the lens to the sensor and a wider mount changes what you can do with a lens? Building a larger uh, diameter lens mount allows for us to have a larger, a potential for a larger rear element. That larger rear element can now be closer to the image plane, the sensor itself. Um, and our lens designers, they're able to take that light path as it comes through the lens. It can get really, really nerdy type stuff here, but you can take that light path through the lens and the, the less you bend that light, uh, the better the image quality. The more you have to bend it and shape it and fit it down into the, the pipeline, you start to pull chromatic aberrations and all kinds of distortion, and you have to correct for that as the light travels through the lens. So that adds more lens elements, that makes the lens heavier, that uh, creates optical challenges. So by building a shorter flange back distance and a very large diameter as much as we could, keeping the size small, um, our lens engineers really have the, the ability to create lenses that they couldn't do it before. They had restrictions because of that mirror box. They had to fit everything into that space and removing the mirror allowed for that, that close distance and the large mount at the same time. It's allowed us to actually maximize the sharpness all the way across the plane too. Uh, our, our lenses are designed uh, to not only be sharp at a specific aperture, maybe a couple of stops down from their prime, uh, from their wide open aperture, but as sharp as at 1.8 or whatever their maximum aperture is, uh, as they would be a couple of stops down. For instance, uh, our uh, 51.8, uh, the sharpness of that lens is pretty remarkable and wouldn't have been possible on an F mount with the mirror system. Nikon's leaning a little more towards using the smaller form factor and trying to build lenses that are still optically great, but very compact and light, while Canon's been taking advantage of this flange distance and wider mount to kind of start off with some showstopper ones like this. 28 to 70, 28. Mirrorless isn't going to take over the DSLR. DSLR is not going away. Like I no. said, we, we introduced two super tellies when we introduced the R simultaneously because we knew our pros out there using 1DXs and other cameras like that, those aren't going away anytime no. soon and we have to be able to support those end users as well. That said, the challenges of, of working with this and building the system up, um, working with a mirrorless system, you're able to see through the viewfinder in ways you couldn't see before. You never have to take your eye away from the viewfinder to see what's going on our playback or maybe in a low light environment. You can see through that in, in ways you can't see through an optical viewfinder system. It's much brighter through that EVF. Uh, so there's advantages to both systems and in many cases our pros and, and our even our uh, enthusiasts and, and beginners they'll have both systems because this fits this scenario and this fits this scenario and we will continue making dslrs as right. well and f mount lenses as long as they can be adapted to the z system then there's that uh, interchangeability between the two nikon hasn't in the past had a great deal of video experience so the mirrorless platform was a perfect jumping off point for uh, sort of elevating our video uh, prowess. Uh, and the electronic viewfinder was one thing that we absolutely had to make certain was the highest possible quality. And for video production, that's uh, made all the difference in the world. This has become one of our, uh, or the most premier video camera that we've ever produced in the Z6. This allows us to uh, uh, create a camera that will operate like a uh, an SLR, a traditional SLR from eye level uh, shooting video where we couldn't really do that before with a DSLR. With the introduction of the 5D2 a few years back, we you know we kind of fell into the video and even in the higher end movie industry with, with that product and then the, the C-series uh, cinema products were, were born based on a lot of that as well. When you move into something like uh, the R-series and now the new RF lenses, 
we've built technology into the lenses, such as the control ring, uh, we have the, the focus ring and the zoom ring, all three pieces now on that lens that you can use as a filmmaker, and you're, you're working, like you said, through the viewfinder. For the first time, uh, people who shoot video will have access to uh, uh, ProRes RAW, uh, which is coming soon, which is as exciting as a still photography market, uh, finding the, the first electronic uh, uh, RAW file. It's, yeah. it's, it's going to unlock uh, the video potential of the uh, Z6 and Z7 for us uh, I, I, like never before. Well, it's a really exciting time for anyone who likes photography or video. So, Absolutely. Stephen Drew, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you very much. Thank you, folks.